How do you feel about having to use technologies to keep in touch with your loved ones? My name is Koen Deurs. In the last decade, I've interviewed hundreds of migrants, including refugees and expatriates, about how they maintained relationships uh, across distance through devices. As a result of the COVID-19 health pandemic, my findings now hold for everyone. In this pop-up video, I will share two surprising findings for my fieldwork. First, migrants have pioneered digital intimacy. Second, I realized that we can learn from connected migrants how to cope with the COVID-19 health pandemic. Let me reflect on my passion for this topic by sharing an anecdote. My passion for this topic dates back to my youth. I grew up in the little town of Grave in the southeast of the country. Many of my friends living in, uh, were living in a local refugee center, where I often went to play basketball. We are talking here about the mid-90s. Many of the camp residents owned mobile phones and used email to keep in touch with loved ones and family abroad. After having studied media and communication, a decade later, I realized that many of the young refugees I played basketball with were actually early adopters of technology. For me, this was an important realization. It motivated me to tell different stories about migration and digital technology. And I feel that it's, it remains very urgent to challenge persisting stereotypes. Uh, politicians, journalists, and social media discussions often focus on technologies to reinforce fears uh, of migrant newcomers. For example, in the 90s, the satellite dish emerged uh, as a symbol of the supposed failure of migrant integration in the Dutch society. Uh, it was assumed that the fact that migrants could uh, tune in to channels from their home country, that they would turn their backs towards Dutch society. Research by my colleagues and myself, however, showed that migrants would combine media from their uh, home country as well as media from their host country. In the late 1990s, uh, the, the fears of technologies were projected on internet cafes and call shops, such as the one we are standing here today. Here, research again showed that migrants would use uh, these places, internet cafes, to connect with their home countries, but also uh, to connect with local bureaucracies. In the last five years, we've seen how fears were projected on smartphone use of refugees and migrants. In the wake of the so-called European refugee crisis, starting five years ago, uh, a lot of attention uh, emerged from refugees arriving upon European shores carrying smartphones. For example, illustratively, the front page of the Algemeen Dagblad carried the headline Why are refugees taking selfies all the time? For us Europeans, the image of refugees carrying smartphones didn't fit with the stereotype, with our uh, uh, idea of what a refugee would look like. However, our research showed that for many refugees, smartphones have become as essential uh, as their basic needs, as essential as food, drink and a place to sleep. As frontrunners in technology adoption, I learned we can uh, learn uh, a lot actually from connected migrants, also to negotiate living in these pandemic times. First, the choice for a platform matters. Uh, ritual messaging sustains relationships. Uh, migrant families would, for example, send each other good, a good night message in their group chat. However, when your mother is living in a war zone, just the fact of seeing the little blue tick appear uh, after sending a message in WhatsApp uh, can be meaningful, can offer a sense of reassurance. However, migrants also share that they sometimes feel as if their phone is burning in their pockets. Uh, similarly, like we are uh, engaging in digital communication in these pandemic times, we have to balance demands. We have to cope and negotiate Zoom fatigue. Emotional events are best shared not via text, but via audio and video messages. Uh, migrants would, for example, show their newborn baby to their grandparents using Zoom or Skype. Uh, birthdays would be celebrated with a uh, shared, uh, shared cake through the screen uh, or drinks. Romantic partners living apart uh, would experiment with vo video calls to have sex. And for an intense moment, screens can offer a sense of co-presence and a sense of togetherness. However, hanging up is painful. I'm reminded here of an experience shared by 23-year-old Ifra, uh, a young woman from Somalia who was awaiting family reunification with her husband. She shared that 
For a brief moment, I feel that I can bridge distance when I'm using Skype. However, when hanging up, I'm reminded again of this distance and it's this distance uh, which kills you. Second, it's important to reflect about what we want to reveal about ourselves uh, and to whom online. This is called negotiating so-called context collapse. Like the awkwardness of strangers mingling at a wedding, uh, migrants discussed how they curate uh, their specific profiles targeted towards specific audiences. I'm thinking here of 19-year-old Amani, a young woman from Syria who maintains several profiles across several social media platforms uh, to curate a specific uh, image of herself. She curated one specific image tailored towards her family living still in Syria, which would meet uh, conservative Islamic uh, expectations, for example, of gender and sexuality. Towards uh, her peers living here in the Netherlands, uh, she would create a specific different image, uh, which was much more in line with global youth culture. I'm thinking here also of experiences shared by LGBTIQ migrants who would uh, dare to come out of the closet uh, in their profiles directed at contacts living in Amsterdam while they would remain closeted in communication directed uh, at friends, for example, living overseas. So what can we learn in this crash course on digital intimacy about the future of communication under pandemic times? I'm here again reminded of Amani, who four years ago mentioned that she was totally fed up with the fleetingness of digital communication. She resorted to writing letters in classic Arabic. And similarly, in the last couple of months under COVID, we've seen how people have returned to writing letters and to sending postcards. It's time that we shift uh, the frame away from stereotypes about migration to seeing migrants as pioneers of a new time.